So uh, we have two award-winning documentary filmmakers, Ramona S. Diaz of A Thousand Cuts and PJ Ravel, or Raval from uh, Color Ganda. Let me read a little bit of their bio. So just in case you don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ramona S. Diaz is an award-winning Asian American filmmaker whose films have screened in Sundance, the Berlin, the Berlin, Tribeca, the Benel, IDF, Benale. Benale, uh, IDFA, and many other top tier film festivals. Her latest film, A Thousand Cuts, goes inside the escalating war between the government and the press. Uh, the documentary follows Maria Ressa of Rappler, a renowned pop journalist who has become a top target of President Rodrigo Duterte's crackdown on the news and media. She's also made other documentary films before that, uh, Imelda in 2004, The Learning 2011, Don't Stop Believing, Everybody's, Every Man's Journey uh, in 2012, and Motherland in 2017. Um, our next guest speaker is PJ Raval, and he, his latest film is called Call Her, Call Her Ganda. Uh, it's a feature documentary following the story of Jennifer Loud, a local transgender woman who was found dead in a motel room in the port of Olongapo, Olong Philippines, uh, with a 19-year-old U.S. Marine uh, as a leading suspect. Call Her Ganda, world premiered at the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival, followed by the, an international premiere at Hot Docs in Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Ramona and PJ, to our panel. Hi. Hi. Right. <laughs> nice to be here. Glad to be uh, here too. <laughs> Our first question I'm going to address to both of you is this. Um, why or what did you, what motivated you to become a documentary filmmaker? Um, should I go first? Yeah, um, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to hear your response. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just say what she said. Um, uh, Actually, I started in fiction. So I went to film school. Um, I went to Emerson College in Boston and um, I was studying fiction. And after um, graduating at Emerson, uh, from Emerson, I went to Los Angeles and worked in LA for a bit uh, in series television and then went back to the Philippines uh, thinking I was only gonna go back for a year, but I stayed for five years. And I, uh, that's when, I think when I went back to the Philippines, that's when I got really interested in um, documentaries because there was so much going on in um on the streets and it was just so vibrant i felt like i could tell those stories but i had no idea how to make a documentary i wasn't you know it was all new to me so i i actually went back to the states to do a graduate program in documentary filmmaker uh, making uh, at, at stanford and then um after that um so that that's really when you know my interest um I, so my, my interest is really rooted in like going back to the Philippines and finding out that it's, you know, it's possible to take, to tell these documentary stories about the Philippines. And then my first film out of school was Imelda. So that's how, you know, and um, uh, yeah, so that's how I, I started and, uh, and haven't stopped since. Because <laughs> that was in, I released Imelda in 04. So we premiered in 04. Yeah, that's my or that's my origin story. Okay. PJ? PJ? Yeah, so I never really set out to be uh, a filmmaker period to be quite honest. <laughs> like I uh my you know when I was in school my I was taking art classes actually. Um believe it or not, I was a double major in uh visual arts and molecular biology. So I actually have a degree in molecular biology. Um, and I was actually working in a lab and um, making art and just kind of doing that for a bit and then got into photography. And then from photography, I think is where I really started um, getting really, really interested in kind of, uh, you know, using a lens, seeing through a camera. And so I thought I was actually going to stay kind of in the art world um, and mostly focusing on photography. Um, but I ended up taking a film class uh, right before I had finished my undergraduate program, which was at um, University of California, San Diego. Um, and it kind of stuck with me. So then after that, I, you know, I worked for a couple years um, uh, doing a little bit of television work, doing a little bit of, at the time, it was called New Media. 
uh, work. Um, and this was around the first kind of um, tech boom that kind of happened. And I found myself in, um, you know, it was like the beginning of like, kind of like the startups. And so I started working at a startup company doing, um, which was really interesting at the time, it was this company from India and they were um, taking video content and streaming it online. Um, I mean, this is back in the late nineties. And what was interesting is everyone was like, nobody wants to watch anything on the internet, on your computer, <laughs> you know? So, but around the same time, yeah, around the same time though, I started thinking like, well, you know, I, I kind of knew I wanted to go um, back, to back to school and do a little bit more studying. So I actually applied to art programs and I was planning on going to a visual arts program um, and even when I was studying art, I kind of shifted from like, I originally was in painting um, with a little bit of sculpture and I moved into photography. So I thought I was going to go to grad school and just continue like a media art program. But I randomly applied to a film program just out of, you know, a friend was like, oh, you know, you really like photography and you, you know, enjoyed that film class. Why don't you try, um, you know, consider going to a film program and I got into one of them just as kind of surprisingly and I decided to go. Um, so I ended and I just thought for myself, I was like, oh, this will just be a fun kind of, you know, for the next like three years, I'll, I'll study film and then who knows what I'll do after that. But while I was um, a grad student, I just kind of started right away. Um, and, and after I finished, like even when I was still in school, I had shot um, a feature as a cinematographer. So I started working largely as a cinematographer, which um, made sense because I was very comfortable with the camera. You know, I have a photography background, um, but I was always directing and producing my own films. Um, so for several years, I worked, I mean, for like a decade, I would say I worked largely in independent narrative um, features, you know, working as a cinematographer. Um, also making my own films. Um, and then I just randomly one day um, started shooting documentary work. Um, and actually I'll credit one film. I ended up shooting a film called Trouble the Water, which was nominated for an Oscar in um, 2008, but that was shot 2005. Um, it was around Hurricane Katrina. And that was kind of like the first experience where I was like, oh wow, documentary really is exciting in a lot of ways that narrative films for me at the time was starting to feel a little, um, maybe a little frustrating because um, there's just a lot, you know, there's something nice about nonfiction filmmaking, which is um, kind of the unknown. So there's like a little adventure quality to it. Um, and, uh, and you kind of don't know where it's gonna take you. So that was really exciting. And, um, and I think around the same time, you know, this is around the early 2000s, there was a lot of filmmakers just waiting to make films. So it was a lot of independent narrative filmmakers waiting to like, you know, get a certain budget to, to be able to go. And I saw these nonfiction filmmakers who were like, give me a camera and I'm gonna start. Um, and there was something really appealing about that. So I, so around the same time I decided to try to make my own documentary. And so the first documentary that I made was with a friend of mine, uh, also released in 2008. And um, so funny enough, I, I actually never made a documentary on my own up until the first feature do documentary I made. So I made a short documentary since, but that was after I had already made like two or three documentary features. So, um, so I've never officially studied documentary. I mean, I took a documentary class when I was in, um, you know, when I was in film school. Oh yeah, so I should mention, so I, you know, I ended up going to, to uh, University of Texas at Austin, UT Austin. Uh, uh, to get an MFA in film and during, you know, and for me that program was really great because you could do narrative or, you know, you could do fiction or nonfiction. I mostly focused on fiction, but certainly I was with classmates who were working on nonfiction. Um, and, uh, and I did, um, you know, one of the classes we had to make a nonfiction, but even then I kind of made like an experimental film. <laughs> so I had never really, um, made a nonfiction film until I started shooting, you know, professionally. And that's when I started. And it was really exciting to, to kind of see that. Okay. Faye? Oh, Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Go ahead. Next question. 
Oh, uh, unmute yourself. Okay, all right. That's it? Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. DJ. Okay, my question is really the, the both about the both films that we're featuring, A Thousand Cuts and uh, Call Her Ganda. You know, what are, since we're introducing how to make documentaries, so we have to deal with challenges in terms of like, it can be probably a long answer, your budget research, you know, like what if you're the person that you're filming for a documentary wants you to stay there, you have to, you know, follow them wherever they go. And that could be irritating for some people. So what are those challenges that you have? I guess it's Ramona, you know, A Thousand Cuts is a very controversial quote unquote film. According to Duterte. <laughs> According to Duterte. <laughs> um, so a thousand cuts. Um, so uh, the origin of that was. So uh, let me take you back. It was 2016. Mm -hmm. I was just finishing my previous film, Motherland. Uh, we were actually preparing it for Sundance. That was 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Duterte became president, right? Uh, in mm -hmm. May 2016. And shortly thereafter, the drug war started. And shortly thereafter, there were a lot of really horrific pictures coming out of the Philippines by Rafi Lerma. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, his iconic picture of the man, cra uh, of the woman cradling her husband. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. They called it the Pieta, oh, Michael yeah. Angelo's Pieta. That's, um, so all those pictures have now since become iconic of the drug war. But then they were so new and they were horrific. And I couldn't take my eyes off them. And also, I, I was... I was born and raised in the Philippines. So I grew up under martial law. I'm a martial law baby. So I understood that this was something, this was like a going back to something, a dark time that was um, alarming and troubling for me. Um, so I said, you know, let me look. That's always, it's always stories that I cannot get, um, I can't, uh, I can't get out of my head, right? It's like, I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking of those stories. That's how I first started. It's like, oh, and then you're like, oh, really? Do I have to make a film about Duterte? But um, late 2017, I found myself in the Philippines, and, and then I started talking to journalists. I met Rafi, I met Patricia Evangelista then, and uh, a lot of the other um, Ezra, a lot of the other photographers. And I, I got, uh, when I hit the ground in the Philippines, I realized a lot of people were doing the drug war. A lot, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's spectacle, it's, it's bloody. I mean, it's everything. Uh, I, I understood why documentary filmmakers would be attracted to that story. Uh, it was also a breaking news. So I, not only was I uh, fighting with, not fighting, but competing with other documentary filmmakers, but also broadcast news, right? So I just felt it was, it was too crowded and I don't know how to do breaking news. I don't know how to navigate broadcasters and, and fight for that kind of access. So I started, looking around, I, I said, okay, I know I want to make a film about the Philippines under Duterte, that's for sure. Um, and I started looking around and realized, um, uh, I found Maria Ressa. I mean, I knew of her, of course, she was the face of CNN for a very long time in Southeast Asia, but she was the one really calling out the numbers and calling out impunity and um, and uh, uh, getting Duterte pissed off, you know, because of her of Rappler's reporting. Uh, but more than that, she was not only talking about the numbers and the drug war and questioning impunity, she was also questioning or talking about disinformation, right? She was talking about weaponization of social media, disinformation, algorithms, when no one, very few people were talking about it. And it was fascinating for me. And I thought, ah, this opens up the drug war for me for me, because it's still about Duterte, it's still about impunity, but there's this social media thing going on. So I, um, Sheila Coronel, who is one of the, an academic dean in the journalism school at Columbia, you know, she's also Filipina. I, she's, um, she's a consultant on the film, on my film, A Thousand Cuts. So I said, Sheila, I need to meet Maria Ressa. So we, I was introduced and I met Maria and, um, and sort of that started the conversation um, I actually, we actually, Maria and I tell the story because I almost met her when I was doing Imelda. You know, Imelda sued me and my distributors in the Philippines. That's a long story, but I had to go back to the Philippines to defend the film 
and in 04, because Imelda said uh, we were, anyway, she sued us. Um, and at that time, the press wanted to talk to, and Maria wanted to talk to me about the film. And I turned her down because she, I heard that she didn't like the film, Imelda. I'm like, I, I don't want to talk to anyone who's, I want to lit litigate the case, but I don't want to litigate the film. So I said, if they want to ask me about the case, I'll talk to them. But I was also in the middle of a really grueling film festival um, uh, run and um, a tour. And I and with Imelda suing us, it was just so stressful. I didn't want to talk to like, especially Maria Ressa at that time of CNN. And she didn't like the film. I said, no, turn her down. And so when I met her, like, oh my God, this is 04, right? So I met her in 2018. So like 14 years later, I'm like, in her office asking her if I could like talk to her to about this other film and all that and I'm hoping oh my god I hope she doesn't remember that I turned her down but one of the first things she said she goes you know I've always wondered why you turned me down for that interview and I'm like oh my god should I pretend I said of course I can't pretend that uh, you know I don't remember so I said yeah you know I, we have to talk about that she goes I think we'll have a lot to talk about right so to her credit she still you know we still she, she she still sort of entertained the idea of film because the way I work, I follow someone for a very, very long time. It's very immersive. And um, I don't get, the access is always ne a negotiation throughout, right? I don't expect them to say yes immediately because what I want is the world. I want to be in their life deeply for a long time. So I always give it to them in bits until they get used to me. Really, that's really what it is. And, um, and usually I move to the Philippines. When I make a film, uh, like for this, I moved there in 2018, right after, uh, I remember right after the Spirit Awards in 2018, I moved to the Philippines um, to find my film, you know, to, to look for my film. So, uh, and then I met Maria, but then I was still, um, I had this idea for the film of being very Robert Altman-esque, meaning it's ensemble. So um, as you see in the film, I still, I still feature Duterte's um, closest, you know, inner circle, like Mocha Uson and Bato, because I got access to them. Uh, and the, why I got access to them is because they knew my previous work. They wanted to be in a film. They understood that I was also, my audience was beyond the Philippines and they understood the power of narrative. So they said yes. And then Maria said yes. But, uh, you know, in terms of my work, I just, follow the story it's very zen and at some point someone becomes the center of gravity and maria became the center of gravity of my film because she got arrested she got you know and we were by then when she started getting arrested we were deeply in her life like she, she by then understood that i was just going to stick around for however long <laughs> the story took right not however long i said till the end of elections so till after midterm elections in 2019 um so that was it um and I, I it's like an exploration for me and i always say the time that i don't shoot is just as important as the time i shoot so if you have a 12-hour day for example if i shoot for only two hours but they're golden they're the best and i know there will be scenes that will probably end up in the film that's well worth it for me so that's why my crew, I, I usually use the same crew because they understand that. They understand it's a lot of waiting. It's like, I always say we're going on safari and we're observing people in their natural habitat. And that's what we film. But you have to be very patient. And also you have to uh, work for the trust of the people you're filming. I don't expect them to trust me immediately. I know I have to work for it. And, um, and I have to be very transparent. A transparency is key. They need to know, like Maria knew I was filming Mocha and General Bato. Uh, General Bato and Mocha knew I was filming Maria, right? Transparency to me is really important because um, I think that's how I really get the trust. Um, and if they really, uh, if they understand what it is I'm doing, uh, I think it's easier to get that trust. But I don't expect it at first right so it's it's a kind of working 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 towards a trust so um i realize I, I i like having what i call containers in my film because i hate shooting forever right i want i like to know that i'm going to end at a certain time like 
So for example, my other films, the learning was one year in the life of the teachers, right? The first year teaching the, in, 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 in the US. Uh, there were Filipinos being re recruited to teach in the US. Uh, Every Man's Journey about Arnel Pineda, his first summer with a band, right? His first tour ending, culminating in his, uh, in, in um, the concert in Manila, right? So that was a container. Uh, Motherland, it's a container of like seven weeks. Uh, the, the time it takes for a, a mother who gives birth to a premature baby to stay in the hospital, seven weeks. I, I like that because I hate shooting forever. I, I, it just makes me crazy. So my container for um, a thousand cuts was the midterm elections. Um, and you cannot really plan this. And that's why I love documentaries because you never know what it will give you. The time it took, for the elections from February through May was when everything happened to Maria. She got arrested twice, she had to go to court, she had to, everything happened to her. So there were two parallel stories where Maria getting arrested constantly. And then there was the midterm elections, which is, as you know, in the Philippines, very spectacle, right? It's song and dance and it's very cinematic. And that's why I wanted it to be against the backdrop of the elections. But you can't write that, that stuff up. I had no idea that during those election time, Maria was also going to have this sort of dramatic arc to her story. And you get lucky. So that happened. And then we ended, we ended filming at the end, uh, you know, in, in May after the elections. And then we followed her for quite a bit after that because she was going to, we filmed her in London and New York and Washington, D.C., for, we went back to her hometown in Thompson River, New Jersey. Uh, but already we were cutting. We were cutting and um, uh, we were already looking at the footage. My, my editor, who I only use one editor, she's cut all my films, started looking through the footage already because we were trying to make the Sundance um, deadline. Um, so that was that. Then we, we you know, then we, um, then we, really, we premiered at Sundance. So, yeah, so that's, that's basically how it all came down. Like, <clears throat> your turn. <laughs> PJ, yes. <your> turn. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I actually, uh, you know, got invited to go to the Philippines to screen some of my previous films uh, by Nick DeOcampo, if anyone knows Nick DeOcampo. Um, who is a film scholar and filmmaker. Yeah, very amazing. Um, and he uh, was kind of restarting um, the Pink uh, Film Festival, which was the Quezon City uh, Pink Film Festival that was also going to coincide with the first uh, Quezon City Pride celebration. So um, yeah, so he invited mm -hmm. me to come and screen um, two of my previous documentaries, uh, which I did. And I was super excited to go. Um, you know, I'm born and raised in the United States, um, and I'd only been to the Philippines a few times, mostly as a kid, um, and really had not had any experiences, um, you know, going back for any extended period of time, as, and, you know, definitely not on my own. So, um, so for me, this was going to be an exciting time. You know, I was going to go, I was going to, you know, attend the festival, stay for a month, um, maybe longer, travel around, you know, just kind of, um, immerse myself in the Philippines for a bit. Um, and when I arrived, it was shortly after Jennifer Laude had been killed. Um, and, uh, and certainly, I kind of um, was aware of what was happening, you know, the kind of what Ramona was mentioning, there was breaking news, right? So there was definitely um, reports that were happening, like on GMA and, you know, ABS, CBN, and, um, and definitely in my social media feeds, you know, um, uh, I was definitely seeing a lot of uh, posting about it and there was a lot of misgendering and a lot of, um, you know, um, confusion about what was happening. Um, but, uh, but also it was mostly, most of the reporting at least that I had seen or heard was um, just kind of factual, you know, um, and as they were discovering facts, putting that out there, you know, she was found dead in this motel room, you know, the suspect was, a white man, and then it was an American, and then it was a Marine. Um, and that's where, um, you know, I think the news really started taking it in terms of what, uh, you know, what conflict this was, right, in terms of 
potentially having a, a U.S. Marine be a suspect for um, for killing a Filipino citizen. Um, so, so that was kind of happening while I was there during this festival. And what was kind of uh, interesting about being there at that time was also, as I mentioned, it was the first pride celebration of Kessel City. So in one hand, you had all these people out on the street marching unapologetically, um, you know, in solidarity and, you know, getting support in the process of doing it, which was really great to see. Like, it was really wonderful to see um, the kind of like welcoming that they were having, but at the same time, they were also protesting, right? So on one hand, you had this pride, celebra pride celebration going on, and then on this other hand, you also had, um, you know, this protest in terms of the death of Jennifer Laude, right? So, so kind of my introduction was here is this uh, politically activated um, LGBTQ plus base, right? That's celebrating and at the same time protesting. Um, and, and so, you know, kind of long story short, I ended up on a panel for um, global LGBT rights, right? And um, I, you know, I've made lots of films about LGBTQ plus um, uh, people and stories. And, um, and uh, you know, I think it was interesting for people to hear also my perspective coming from the United States. Uh, but, all, but alongside me on that panel was attorney Virginia Suarez, who is one of the Laude family um, attorneys. Um, and several of the activists who were really involved with um, the Justice for Jennifer uh, movement that was starting to form. And it was on that panel that I saw a clip of Nanai, right, with Jennifer's mom, um, that Virgie had filmed on her cell phone, which was basically Nanai saying, you know, how could someone do this to my beautiful child? I, you know, some, you know, I'm never, I'm not going to stop until someone um, is held accountable for this. And I was just really moved by um, the clip, um, and it was, and it was a really um, powerful um, message, that, and um, and it was just very raw, very passionate. Um, and on that panel, you know, Virgie kind of talking about what this case um, meant to her and also what it kind of symbolized and knowing more about the facts and just kind of the situation of it all. Um, I started understanding kind of like the larger picture beyond the initial facts that were kind of being reported on. And I don't necessarily um, believe in fate, for instance, but what was interesting was on that panel, um, since it was part of the festival, a lot of the attendees had seen my films at that point because they had screened both my films and then, you know, and then the last thing was I was on this panel with, with um, you know, these activists and this attorney. Um, and so someone in the audience said, oh, uh, you know, direct PJ, you know, or well, you should, you should make this your next film. And I, and I actually responded and said, absolutely, someone needs to make this film because it's really, you know, it's really important. And this is, you know, you know, you need to get the story out in the world. I don't know if it should be me is what I said at the time. I said, you know, I've, uh, you know, I haven't really um, spent that much time in the Philippines. I've, you know, I'm born and raised in the United States. Um, you know, maybe it should be a trans activist here. Maybe it should be someone in Kesson City, you know, someone who's already part of this kind of movement that's forming. I'm not quite sure if it's me. Right. Um, but I said, absolutely, someone needs to someone needs to do this. But afterwards, I ended up going to lunch with um, attorney Virginia Suarez and a lot of the activists and and that, you know, and the subject just kept com coming up again, like, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And, you know, and and, uh, you know, and over the lunch, we were just kind of talking about it. And um, and I think I started understanding that um, perhaps I would, ha you know, perhaps I'm bringing a unique perspective to it, right? As someone coming from the United States who's somewhat aware of the Philippines, but not entirely, but having grown up in my experience, knowing that uh, the Philippines is largely overlooked in US history, <laughs> right? I mean, as someone who's educated in the public school system in California, um, you know, you know, growing up in the United States, anytime you see the Philippines listed in a history book, you try to read up on it, right? Um, and there was very little information and a lot of narratives that I never really learned. And so 
I don't know, there was something about hearing the story of Jennifer and, and speaking to Virgie and all the activists that maybe start thinking like, well, maybe I should make a film that I myself would like to see, a, you know, a film that I wish I would have seen that really makes me, you know, that could make me understand the larger picture of why, um, of also why this is important, right? Like in one hand we have, um, you know, the death of a sister and a daughter and a loved one um, and the fact that, you know, she is galvanizing all these people, um, you know, was a really powerful thing to be witnessing. Um, so I, so I told Virgie, you know, I think I am interested, <laughs> you know, I said, I, I said, maybe I take it back, you know, maybe I, maybe I should make this into a documentary, but I said, in order for me to do it, um, I really need to be certain that I would have, um, the blessing and the permission of the family, right? Because something that's gonna be so personal and the fact that so much of it was inspired by seeing this clip of Nanai, I said, I, I kind of already know that for me, the heart of this film is going to be Jennifer's mother. So if, um, you know, if Nanai agrees to it, then I'll definitely consider this. But if not, I don't know if I'll be interested. So I, um, gave Virgie my films to show to um, the Laudes and, um, you know, she was able to put me in touch and I, you know, I sent them a little, a note saying, you know, what I was interested in. And then, um, and then we met. And what was interesting is when we met, they were already saying like, okay, you know, what, what, you know, you can start filming, <laughs> and I was, you know, and so it was really, and it was really an honor at the time, because up until then, I think they had been very hesitant about having anyone follow them behind closed doors. Like, certainly they had been out in the public making, you know, press statements, but no one had been given permission to actually film them beyond that. And so the fact that they were allowing me to do that was, um, you know, really quite an honor. So I started doing that. And then kind of what Ramona was saying, like having a container, you know, at this point, um, uh, you know, Pemberton, um, the Marine who at the time was accused, um, it was, it was um, you know, it was starting to be clear that there was going to be some kind of trial and under the visiting forces agreement, it has to be done within a year. So I kind of knew that within one year, um, a lot was going to happen, certainly. So that kind of was my, you know, that was going to be my container for this film. So I ended up, um, I didn't stay in the Philippines the whole time, but I ended up kind of coming back and forth. And, you know, the fact that it was um, somewhat structured over a trial made it um, uh, very manageable in terms of understanding where major things were going to be happening, right? Like there's going to be an opening, you know, there's going to be a pre-trial, there's going to be the opening um, uh, arguments, you know, and, um, and then the defense is going to present. So I kind of knew the kind of key moments I needed to really pay attention to. Um, but I'll be honest, during this time period, um, I would go and film for like two, three weeks and then I would take a week off and I would travel around the Philippines and see areas that I had never been. Um, and it was great, you know, I ended up spending Christmas in the Philippines, um, I, which I had done before, but I had done it with family. And this time I was kind of like, oh, I'm gonna travel around and kind of see, you know, some of the culture. So for me, it was a really formative experience because I ended up staying in the Philippines for quite a bit and kind of, um, you know, making my own connections there. And, and I'm definitely interested in telling more stories from there. But, um, but uh, what's interesting is I guess um, for me, I went to the Philippines not expecting anything and I ended up um, making a film there. <laughs> And now, and now I'm being interested in making more films there. So it's interesting to hear Ramona's experience too. Like I just happened to be there and this thing was happening and suddenly it was like, oh wait, you know, I should, I should make this into a film. Um, you know, and a lot of the times when, you know, since we are talking about, you know, making a documentary, a lot of the times it's also about access, right? Like so many people try to get access, but sometimes the access is just in front of you and you're like, wow, I, I, I really should, you know, like maybe from an outside perspective, it looks different, but you know, when you, when you're in something, right, sometimes you're, you're not even recognizing like the, maybe the, um, you know, privileged access you have at that moment, right, to a story. Um, so um, yeah, so that's kind of, so that's kind of how that film came about. So it was brought up earlier from Ramona's 
uh, explanation of sorts that led me to this next question that I have. And this is addressed to you as well, PJ. Um, let me get it. Here it is. Um, since both of your films had dealt with either indirectly or directly, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I've seen both your films, but had, but since they dealt with the Duterte administration, have there been concerns of safety? Well, you know, I was following a woman who had to wear a bulletproof vest, right? So there was that. Um, and we did talk about it. I mean, it's a, safety was a concern because of course we weren't wearing bulletproof vests and we sort of, we talked about it, we tried it, but have you ever shot with a bulletproof vest? Not a good thing. In the heat of summer in Manila, not, not, it's, it's not a fun experience. So um, we consciously said, no, forget it. We, we're not gonna do it. It wasn't really fear of Duterte because President Duterte knew I was making the film. I actually, because we had to get special permission from his, uh, from the, Office of Communication and from the Presidential Security Command to get uh, to shoot right in front of him during the rallies. Otherwise, we would have been back in the press box and I wanted to shoot him really closer than we could get from the press box. So I think uh, the fact that he knew we were shooting, we were very obvious because I also had a foreign crew and we were there. I mean, we were not hiding, right? Uh, I think the fact that we were uh, very visible to him was our security, right? He knew we were there, we weren't hiding. I think if we were hiding, then it would have been, I would have felt less secure. So it wasn't really from the administration. The danger is always the crazy one, right? The crazy one who thinks that, you know, they're doing the president a favor to harm or to, to inflict harm or violence. It's a random, it's not really random, but it's a violence that, that maybe it's not part of the administration. That's really the danger. Um, and also the danger is we were, aside from, I brought a couple of cinematographers in and I had um, a couple of sound recorders, but the rest of my crew were local. My field producers, my, my social producers. My, so I had to have a conversation with them and tell them, listen, we're gonna leave. You're, you guys are staying. Um, so, and I want you to know that as we were filming, Maria kept, I mean, uh, she really became the uh, the sort of the target on her back was so obvious and she became, um, you know, the target of the administration more and more. So I had to give the local crew a way out. I said, I'm not going to take it against you if you decide not to participate in this film. You can leave because I understand you, you, stay, you live here. We are going to leave after the, the filming. Do you know that not one of them, not one of them left? Um, and of course, there are so many things that you can read into that. Of course, uh, uh, economic stability of like a, a job for months, right? Because I, I was there for months. So the job was over, God, four months. And um, uh, so I understand that too. But then I, did, but um, all of them stayed. So what I felt like for as long as I can, um, I can keep them safe and I can control their safety, I housed all of them, right? So I, I asked the stakeholders, that my, the, the people who funded my film, I said, I need to have control over their safety for as long as I could during the filming. So we basically like set up camp. The whole crew stayed in like two, three apartments. And also because uh, the local crew lives so far away, you know, and then it would take them two hours to get to their home, two hours to get back. And by the and we had long days. I just wanted them to be rested, right? Or, uh, or safe and also safe. So that's what we did for as long as I could control it, right? Beyond that, if they decide, they did decide to stay, um, I, I wanted them to be aware of the risk because that's such a personal threshold, you know? Um, I, uh, and then for me as well, and for uh, the other crew members as well, it, it, it is at the end of the day, what are you willing to risk? Um, and for me, it was the, the thought that I think I would have regretted it fully if I didn't make this film, right? It would, I mean, then what am I a documentary filmmaker for? 
right? If I don't make this film, I think I, I always say the imagined regret would have been so much harder than like the present danger. So at, at some point you just say, forget. Uh, like PJ, I'm not like faithful or anything, you're, right? I don't leave it up to fate. But at some point you leave it up to fate because you're like, you're there. What am I gonna do, not do it? it it'll be crazy not to film this, but you have to be cautious. You have to be, um, just be aware and not be crazy. Like there were certain parts in the, of the country we couldn't go to, right? Because we were following campaigns, like we couldn't go to Holo, say in the South. There were deep South in, in, in um, Mindanao. Just, I couldn't go there with a white crew. It was impossible, right? Um, so we didn't, or I would go there with just a local crew. Um, there were places that we couldn't access. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't bring my foreign crew and then so I, I took, um, um, local crew sometimes. Uh, just be aware and be very, again, transparency is key. You, it has to be a communication with the crew to tell them, to let them know that this is what we're thinking, especially also with my foreign crew, um, to tell them. But, you know, they were all, they were all down for it. They're like, yeah, of course we're staying, you know. Yeah, it's always a danger, especially this one, but not from the Terte, you know, from from random violence, from the trolls, from whoever crazy person. That's always the problem. That's always the unknown. Yeah, when I started, you know, when I started filming, it was uh, still a Kino, right? So I started filming, um, you know, in 2015, end of 2014, beginning of 2015. So, um, so, you know, during my filming, there was an administration change, <laughs> you know, but, um, but when I started right away, uh, I kind of knew I wanted to make sure that I had um, a strong local producer that could help me kind of guide through every, uh, you know, through starting this. So I started working with Kara Masana Galakpala, who's amazing, uh, amazing documentary filmmaker and, and journalist. Um, so she was able to really guide me, um, you know, very much in the in the kind of um, spirit of helping one another. You know, a lot of the times um, documentary filmmakers help each other. So one of the things I did immediately was call Ramona and ask her, I think I'm going to make a film in the Philippines. Like, you know, do you have any advice for me, you know, um, and kind of. Uh, gather, you know, kind of, you know, get, you know, gather all the, you know, tools and and support that you have um, and advice, right, going into it. So I had a, you know, big uh, talk with Ramona about it, and she gave me a lot of tips and advice on how to how to do things smartly, you know, especially coming from the United States. And um, I largely worked with a local crew also, but I also brought in a cinematographer. Um, and, you know, and of course myself, I was traveling back and forth. So wanting to make sure that I was doing things in a smart way. Um, and, uh, you know, for the most part, I, uh, you know, I was going to be dealing with military, right? Um, and, you know, like we filmed at the Supreme Court, you know, we filmed, you know, so we were in government buildings and we did film on, mil you know, military uh, facilities. Um, but for me, what was important was to capture a lot of the Laude's family experience first. So I spent the first part of my filming uh, just kind of behind closed doors, but following them to, you know, the courthouses and these very um, public places. But it wasn't until halfway through the filming that uh, the Duterte administration became aware, fully aware of what I was doing, including the US military at that point, because at that point um, I was al already accessing and requesting certain documents and certain, um, yeah, access to documents and, uh, you know, what we call FOIAs, which is Freedom of Information Act. So it became very clear what I was doing at some point, but I was also very careful to make sure I had gotten to a point where I felt like I could start uh, being a little bit more public about what I was doing. Um, and I'm sure Ramona is the same way. Some of the times we don't go into it right away and say, hey, this is the documentary world that I'm making and everything. You just kind of allude to what you're doing because A, you're not 100% sure yet what's gonna happen. But B, you also don't wanna jeopardize any of your access and you also don't want to influence whatever's going to happen too much, right? Like it's, if, if there's a big story saying there's a dot crew following 
so-and-so while something's happening, it might influence it. So you kind of, even though it sounds impossible, you kind of try to melt a little bit into the background, let them do their thing, you know, um, kind of incorporate yourself into their lives as a, you know, just like anyone else that they'd be working with. You just happen to be a film crew <laughs> that's filming them. But, um, you know, but trying not to influence too much the actual um, events that are happening, right, and, and influencing the outcome. Um, you're there to kind of go along with the ride, but not necessarily steer it um, for them. Though certainly as a filmmaker, you definitely direct it and steer your film. Um, so that kind of happened. At some point though, um, as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of traveling that um, I also did while I was in the Philippines, both for the film and just for my own. And the administration did send me notice saying that they they knew all the areas that I was going to and to make sure that I was being um, open with them when I was filming and things like that, which I had been. So I, I didn't think there was anything worried there, but but there was a little like, oh yeah, the administration knows <laughs> what, what I'm doing. And, and, you know, and also, as I mentioned before, you know, both, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm, you know, and Ramon is the same way, we travel a lot, right? We end up, you know, going to a film festival in Germany or we ended up going here and here. And my passport, um, you know, I'm a dual, so I have two different passports that they have a lot of stamps on them from different ways. And at some point coming back to the United States, um, and I'm not alone in this experience, there was a little bit of like, you know, where have you been? A little bit more questioning of why do I keep going back and maybe checking my equipment, um, you know, my bags a little bit closer or even opening them for, um, you know, TSA, which maybe I wouldn't have done. So. There, there's a little bit of that that kind of happens. I mean, I certainly have not had it as bad as some documentary filmmakers, but, um, but I think at some point people start recognizing there's some traveling going on and something's happening where you're requesting military access or going into the Supreme Court house and things like that where um, you become, you yourself become visible, right? In a way that um, you don't have control over at that point. Um, so you just have to make sure you're being smart. I didn't have to wear a bulletproof vest, thankfully. Um, Hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's tough. I can it's only really imagine. Hot. I can yeah. only imagine. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, but, but at the same time, you know, you kind of have to be smart about, um, smart about things. So, um, so yeah, so I, you know, so it's interesting. I mean, one thing I will throw out there though, in terms of, thinking about safety or security. For me also, uh, you know, at some point in the film, um, I'm, I'm with uh, Meredith, you know, who's a journalist, um, who at the time is writing a lot for, you know, for BuzzFeed and um, for Vice. And, um, you know, she's in contact with Jennifer's friends, you know, many of them who work as sex workers. So that became an additional concern because um, technically they could be arrested or they could be detained by the police or harassed. Um, and how visible am I going to make them while I'm filming them? You know, um, so we kind of had to think about that also, right? I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not putting any of my subjects at risk. Um, you know, certainly whatever they do in their life, they're at, you know, they make their own choices, but I don't want to put them in additional risk, right? So that is something that I had to also kind of think about and, um, and kind of negotiate, you know, and then just kind of as a joke, not really, but, you know, but, but to be honest too, like, you know, if I, if I bring in a cinematographer from the United States, who's never been to the Philippines, there also has to be a little bit of a, you know, don't eat that street food, you know, <laughs> make sure, you know, here's a bottle of water, you know, that, you know, there's a little bit of that too. Like I have to make sure that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that person's okay and that they're not going to, you know, they're not going to get sick, you know, or make sure that they feel, you know, safe in terms of whatever we're doing. So, um, so there's that also, right. I do think as a director, um, you not only are directing in front of the camera, but you're directing a lot of the people using the camera and around the camera. So you are thinking about, you know, your crew. Like I love hearing Ramona talking about housing, right? Like, like in a lot of ways, you're, you're kind of being like the dead mother of everyone, right? You have to make sure everyone's okay because this is your show, you're running it and they're all there for you. So you wanna make sure you're not putting anyone in some kind of position that makes them uncomfortable or doesn't allow them to do their best work, right? Because you need them to do their best work. 
um, and you need and, and then for the people in front of the camera, you need them to be as comfortable as they would any other day, you know, to say and do whatever they would do. So um, you're always, you know, you're working 24 seven, always thinking about, um, you know, how everything is. And so, so sometimes it is interesting, like when I get a notice being like, hey, we know you've been traveling. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, people are watching me, you know, I've been watching everyone else, <laughs> you know, and making sure everyone else is okay. You know, I should also be paying attention about, you know, myself um beyond the like making sure i eat well and get enough sleep that kind of thing yeah we, but we were certainly we were certainly being not harassed but we were certainly being monitored that's for sure i mean we knew we were being monitored um but it, it was okay there was not I, I don't think they would have not the administration again not that i don't think they would have done anything and we were also filming General Bato, right? Who was the implementer of the drug war and he was like part of the inner circle of, uh, of the president. And I would joke with Bato and say, oh, I said, you know, General, we're being monitored. Is that your people? Are your people? Like, it was like a joke and he'd be like, what? Like pretend he didn't know. Maybe he didn't know. Maybe it just came from another part of the government. But yeah, it was very, um, uh, it was apparent, it was apparent <laughs> that they were. They knew what we were up to. Okay, very interesting. Anyway, um, so you've shown the film here, uh, both of you guys, and also you some, you know, because it's also live streaming, some of the Filipinos have shown both films as well. So when you showed it in Manila, Ramona, A Thousand Guts, and out here, could you compare the reaction of the Filipinos in Manila and the Phil Ams here? And that that's the same with you, PJ. We just want to see the, the reaction of your audience or here. So, um, for a thousand cuts, it was very special because what happened was, you know, of course, you know, we, we premiered the film. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to go on this uh, robust festival run, and then the pandemic happened, right? Uh, and then um, Maria's verdict was coming down in June 15, her very first verdict for cyber right. libel. And it was, a t it was sort of, for me, that was sort of the early days or the dark days of the pandemic, you know, because March, April, May, that, that was really tough. And, and this happened June 15th, I remember her first verdict. And I felt like people were not paying attention to this verdict, which was very important. So uh, by then, uh, we were already picked up by Frontline. We were bought by Frontline. And um, I had this idea to just make it free for 24 hours in the Philippines right before the verdict. Not to influence, because nothing could have influenced that. I mean, it's just to bring awareness to the fact that there was going to be this verdict. Um, so I asked Frontline. Every, it was amazing, because it was like one of these ideas that I had very late, you know, it was like, it was a Monday, or it was a Tuesday before her verdict, which was a Monday, so right a week before her verdict. Um, so I asked, um, you know, I, I had an idea on a Tuesday, I asked my producer, um, um, you know, can, do you, what do you think, is this a crazy idea? Because I want to do it for free, because we can't monetize it, because that would have been very opportunistic. And she goes, oh, absolutely, we can't monetize it, but let's ask, they might say yes. And everyone, all the stakeholders in the film said yes. Frontline said yes. They said, they thought about it for a while. They said, yeah, it's a good idea. But what if we get pirated? I said, for sure we get pirated. I mean, but do we have the wherewithal to, you know, to figure that out? Um, but everyone came on board. And, um, and by Friday, we, uh, we decided that the best and most efficient way was just to put it up in the YouTube channel of Frontline because they get a lot of views, right? So typical view of a frontline show would be like uh, 20,000, right? So I said, you know, that's enough. They said, well, don't expect 20,000 because we have no, you know, this is so sudden. We, we didn't even advertise it, nothing. I said, but you know, it's enough. 20,000 aware of Maria's verdict, that's fine. So we put it up uh, immediately and I said, and then I want, after the 24 hour period, I want to talk back, a live talk back with Maria moderated and me. So they said, okay, great. So it, everyone just got together and made this happen. Um, so we released it on June 12th, which is, as you know, Independence Day. I didn't even think of Independence Day. I was thinking of Maria's verdict on Monday, 15th, June 15th, uh, June 12th at 6 p.m. Manila time. 
6 a.m. here, 24 hours, right? 6 p.m. June 12th to 6 p.m. Uh, June 13th. That was the schedule. So, of course, there were protests, right, for, um, and marches for Independence Day, which was dispersed. So by the time that was dispersed, everyone went home and then we went live, right? So it was in the, okay, so it was Independence Day, ABS-CBN was just shut down, right? The biggest uh, broadcasting company, the anti-terror bill was now going to become law. So there was so much angst and then we come on board and all I did was push it out on social media. I gave it to my Viber chat, you know, different Viber chats. We gave it like, you know, we tweeted about it. We put it on Facebook, but nothing massive. And I just told my friends, yeah, spread the news. In two, 24 hours, we got um, 233,000 full views of the film. 233,000. And then we cut it in 24 hours. And everyone's like, oh my God, don't cut it. There's still more people who want to see it. But I said, no, of course not. Because that was my problem. I mean, I told Frontline only 24 hours. And then we had to talk back. And then so it became this, it became, it trended on Twitter. And then there was so much attention on Maria's like verdict that Monday, right? It was like suddenly big news because it was this, we talked about the verdict right after in the talk back. So that's how we released it there. We haven't been back since. We, we still haven't premiered officially. We are going to premiere um, in December, I think, because I want a, uh, maybe this is a dream. Maybe this is magical thinking, but I want a, like a, a live premiere. I don't know yet, but we're talking maybe end of the year, we're going to do it. Um, but that's, uh, that's how the, the Philippines saw it. That, uh, you know, it was unusual. It was a last minute decision. I'm still happy I did it. Of course, the piracy was incredible, but you know, Frontline uh, was amazing. They stayed on top of it and we were able to quelch it. It was hard, it was really tough. But because I think in the Philippines there is no notion of copyright, right? I mean, they would be sharing their the pirated version on our Facebook page. It's like, oh yeah, I'm like, hey you guys, don't share it on our Facebook page. <laughs> but there was no malice. You know, they were people who wanted to amplify Maria's story. So how can we be mad? But, and yet it was pirated, right? So it was driving us crazy because to them, it's like, you know, of course we have it, you know? Yeah, here it is. I'm like, that's not good guys. <laughs> because we, uh, I mean, we suffered. Uh, it's no longer there. It's a, you know, we were able to damp it, but it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of work. But I'm, am I glad? I, I'm still happy I did it. I think it was the right thing to do at that time. And I, I'm just happy that my, you know, the stakeholders, the funders um, decided, yes, that it's the right thing to do. Because not everyone would have said yes to that crazy idea. And the fact that they said yes was really amazing. That is amazing because not many distributors, you know, would allow for something like no, that. But it they just, wouldn't. Yeah. But it kind of shows the importance of it, right? Like people for got sure. behind the importance of it. You know, uh, PJ, because it was PBS, because it was a front line, you know, Rainy, you, you know, you're working mm -hmm. with Rainy. Rainy was just, yeah, let's do it. And I think, and, and Concordia, they were like, they thought about it for a while and they were like, huh. And also, International is not their market. So it had to be, Cinephil had to sign off to, to their, their uh, international uh, distributors, but we hadn't premiered here. I mean, we weren't out here yet, right? So, but everyone's like, huh, okay. I mean, they thought about it for a while and then they said yes. The fact is, I think if we, I was with a, one of the streamers, that wouldn't have happened. That would have been, that they would have said no. And so the fact that it was the right, stakeholders, the right frontline PBS, uh, it, 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 it's incredible that they said yes. It is incredible, yeah. Anyway, that's a, uh, and so we haven't been back since. We will be back soon, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, so I premiered in 2018 um, and it was actually a really great, um, you know, it was a really great launch, I would say, because we, I would say within four, five months, we 
screened it for a, a real range of audiences um, and locations, right? So we premiered it at Tribeca in New York and then within two weeks brought it to Toronto uh, and premiered it um, internationally at Hot Docs. And then directly after that brought it to Los Angeles for the LA Asian um, American Pacific uh, Film Festival, which was really great. Um, so suddenly screening it for Asian American audiences and then Frameline was right after that, which is LGBT audiences in San Francisco. And then we brought it to Cinemalaya and it was awesome. We were the opening night um, film for the documentary segment of Cinemalaya, which was really great. Um, and, and kind of asking, you know, answering your question about the differences of audiences, you know, up until that point, I had been screening it only in North America, right? So New York, LA, San Francisco, and, you know, and Toronto. Um, and certainly there were Filipinos, Filipino Americans there, a lot of LGBT people, just documentary people. Um, and largely, um, it's kind of what I thought, you know, a lot of people in the United States know a little bit about the Philippines. They've heard of Marcos, for instance, Imelda, you know, but a lot of people have not been paying attention to the politics. I mean, now they're paying attention to it with Duterte, but um, there's, you know, between, between Marcos to Duterte is like, I don't think Americans really have a concept of what happened, you know, to the Philippines. And before Marcos, I don't even think people have a concept of the United States and the Philippines having any kind of relations. You know, and my film in particular goes into the history of it. So I think there was a lot of kind of eye-opening ahas of like, wow, I didn't realize this, you know, um, and especially people from the United States realizing, oh, I didn't realize my government acts this way or has this history. Um, I think when people in the United States think of Asia and the United States, they think of like Vietnam, you know, but they don't think of other countries. And so much of the Philippines history um, is influenced by the United States that I think a lot of people didn't realize that. And as I mentioned, you know, having grown up in the United States and being educated in the US, I can, I can attest to the fact that there's a lot of history that's omitted um, from the history book. So there's that, right? Um, I think for a lot of um, trans individuals in particular, they were moved to see um, the kind of solidarity and um, activation by people in the Philippines over the death of a trans woman, something that you don't see too much of here in the United States. Um, I mean, What's interesting is giving this comment now, right, in the wake of kind of the U.S. and their kind of, you know, recent racial reckoning, right, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, you know, so certainly in the, you know, movement for Black Lives, Black Liberation Movement, there definitely is this kind of activation, but you don't really see that so much over um, trans individuals, for instance, right? Even though during this whole time period, a lot like, you know, there's a lot of LGBT communities, for instance, who've been rallying over Tony McDade, right? Who's a trans person who was, who was um, killed also. So there's awareness, but not to the extent of maybe what they saw happening with Jennifer Laude, right? The fact that you see people protesting, you know, um, US troops out now, uh, you know, with a hashtag of justice for Jennifer, I think was really surprising to a lot of people. Um, when I screened it in the Philippines, it was a really special um, screening because it was, you know, uh, having screened it in North America, we weren't able to have everyone come to um, any of the screenings, though I had already shared it with, um, you know, the family and a lot of the activists at that point, but it was really great to be able to screen it in person, right, and have them all there to actually react to it and, and speak about it. And I think, so for me, that was also a very different experience because it was a lot of people watching it who were in the film. Like not only the main um, subjects of the film, but people who had been to some of these events or had been following the story or went down to the courthouse or you know, marched during one of the sonas, um, you know, carried a sign. So I think it was great for them and a lot of their, um, reactions were, wow, we, we knew what was happening kind of, um, you know, out on the protest line. We didn't know what was happening uh, kind of behind the closed doors, right? Like, uh, you know, that kind of view. So, so it was interesting. And, you know, and since then, 
we've had a lot of, um, you know, what in the documentary world we call impact campaigns, right? Like using your film to create some kind of impact, right? Whether that be cultural, social, or maybe even legislative. So, so there's been some really exciting things that we, you know, did right away. We, you know, we partnered with a lot of Filipino American organizations and let them screen the film, uh, you know, a lot during October, for instance, right? Filipino American History Month and also is for me, the month of um, Jennifer Laude's death anniversary. So we did a lot of that both in the US and the Philippines, which was really great. Um, and thankfully, I worked with a distributor who was open to that as well. We eventually, you know, screened it on um, POV uh, for PBS and did a lot with that. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say yet, but I do have some exciting news, which is we signed with a distributor in the Philippines. Um, and I won't say who, because I don't think we have a um, I don't think there's a press release out yet, but it's a big entertainment company and we're the first documentary they've ever um, uh, distributed or signed. So that's really exciting. So for me, it's also exciting to see that there's um, interest and I think a recognition because, you know, in different parts of the world, documentary is a lot more um, uh, common, right? And, uh, and so I think um, in the Philippines, there's still entertainment companies and distributors who, um, are still kind of you know jumping on board with this idea so it's exciting to see one of them um jump on board with this idea so hopefully you'll be seeing more of it in that way also um but yeah i mean it's been you know i i, I think audiences um have reacted to it in different ways um and then recently there's been a lot going on with um you know pemberton the marine who um was convicted uh, being given an absolute pardon by Duterte and returning to the United States. And so there's been kind of a renewed interest. And I actually just updated the film um, a little bit to kind of address to where it is, because originally the film ended in 2018 and now it ends in 2020. So, um, so we definitely have more screenings uh, coming about. But last thing I will say is that what's been um, very obvious to me, I mean, it's always been kind of obvious, but it's even more so, is that there is a very politically activated uh, Filipino American um, community here in the United States. Um, and so I am more than happy to let them use the film and run with it and use it as a tool, right, to talk about whatever they want to talk about um, and have it, you know, um, be a way to educate their members about something or be able for them to use it and talk about whatever issues that they're focused on. Um, and so that's really exciting, you know, to be able to, to, to do something like that. And we've done a little bit of that in the Philippines also. Um, and I know Ramona, you've worked with Lenny Velasco and Activista um, and so have we, and, you know, so we've been trying to do some of that also. Cause I think it's important what Ramona is saying is to make sure the film gets seen during really crucial times, you know, and trying to not have barriers to seeing it, right? Like, so if you can stream it for free or, you know, play it at some kind of festival and make sure some kind of community is gonna be able to see it or, um, you know, trying to, trying to make it available w at these key moments is really, really important. So we've been doing some of that, of course, also. I was about to uh, ask, like, if one of, if the both of you would, uh do a sequel for both of your documentaries since the changes, but I, not so much. That's true. Uh, um, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna go to the Q&A portion of the, of the panel. And let's see what we got here. Um, a question from Joe for Ramona. Uh, beyond a thousand cuts, what are you working on? Well, I mean, you may have answered this. What are you working on now? And then for PJ, was there a question? Please be the same person thinks we can add towards that. Yeah. Okay. So for Ramona, sorry. For Ramona, uh, what are you working on right now? Or not right so now? So right now, uh, we're still in the middle of rolling out a thousand cuts because we were in virtual cinema over the summer. And then for the fall and winter, we will be touring a lot of, um, we're going to be doing a lot of other uh, virtual film festivals as well. We're still doing film festivals here. We haven't premiered in Europe, so we're going to premiere in Europe at um, a festival that hasn't been announced. I was about, no. Um, so that's happening. 
Um, and we are, and then the big broadcast here is happen is going to be in January after the elections. Well, before the inauguration, but after the election. So that that's a lot of work. That's like a whole totally different kind of work uh, distribution, which um, that is happening right now. Um, I'm also developing and we'll start um, a, a sports documentary. <laughs> I'm doing sports next. I can't really get into it, but it'll be sports. Um, um, it'll be basketball. Basketball. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so I, I'm doing that and then writing some fiction. I've been pitching a lot of fiction um, lately, which is a, a very interesting for me because it's um, in a way very liberating because um you know, I tell, when you've been doing documentaries for a long time, you t tend to say, okay, what really happened, right? What really, and my producer for fiction is like, you can make it up. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I can make it up. So it's very liberating. I, I'm, 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 I'm liking doing fiction. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'm starting to pitch a lot of fiction. And then um, uh, this other doc, which we don't know what's going to happen because, you know, COVID. So we don't know when we're starting. We don't know anything yet, but that's likely to begin in the spring when the season begins. Okay. Um, next question is from uh, Garbos. So I would we'll... love to know what PJ is up to. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> what are you up to, PJ? Ahead, PJ. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, you know, similar to you, distribution goes on forever. So I'm still distributing uh, Call Her Gunda, which, you know, as I mentioned, is now hopefully going to be more the in the Philippines one. too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I have several, uh, you know, this last year I tried to focus on some shorter projects. So I just released a short film actually um, that uh, oh, just yeah. last Wednesday, <laughs> which is, which is uh, called Come and Take It about, um, you know, a young activist who, um, who kind of protests against uh, gun violence that's happening in, in the state of Texas. Um, and so that one is out for free right now. Um, and uh, I'm starting, you know, I, I, during this COVID lockdown, I decided to kind of do a little bit of an experiment, which was um, I'm working with uh, Cecilia Mejia, who's the producer of Yellow Rose, which is um, getting released uh, this month of October. Um, and her and I have been working together on several projects. Um, you know, Cecilia was an impact producer of my last film. And then her and I developed this um, PBS shorts online series that we're doing about Filipino Americans under um, COVID, which is largely self-documented and kind of in a style that can be done uh, during lockdown, which has been really exciting. And I've been focusing mostly on um, kind of a younger generation based in Texas because uh, I want to show that there are Filipinos in Texas <laughs> and kind of <laughs> what that experience is like, especially during this time period and kind of the conversations that it, uh, you know, inspires between family members. So I'm working on that. Um, I actually have a couple other things. I mean, I'm, I'm developing a piece with Frontline that Ramona mentioned earlier. And then, um, and then I'm part of this project called In Plain Sight, which uh, is a collective of uh, 80 artists. And basically what we've been doing is sky typing messages over um, facilities and detention centers of immigrant detention centers um, in protest of the culture of incarceration and immigrant detention. So that's something that's been kind of ongoing too. So there's a lot of things that I have going on. I've been trying to stay away from the documentary feature though for this year. I kind of wanted to experiment a little bit more with shorts. Um, and similar to Ramona, I'm going back into fiction. I have a short narrative film, which I've been wanting to make for a while that I've been developing with um, a screenwriter who's really amazing, Eileen uh, Kabiling, who um, just premiered a film recently called uh, Basuro about um, with Jericho Rosales, which, um, you know, is at Cinema Lion has been playing the film festival circuit. So, so there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of it um, has Filipinos in it, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, but that's kind of what I've been up to. <laughs> I, I, I think there's, um, I, I think the community of Filipino filmmakers and Phil am filmmakers is really forming now, yeah. like never before. I think a community is really, I feel it. I don't know if you feel it, PJ. I feel like we're finally finding each other and finding our collective voice 
because I think before we really just used to meld with uh, other Asian Americans, right? But oh, now yeah. we're, I think we're just carving out, you know, of course we're still part of the Asian um, diaspora, but we are forming this special with like with uh, Cinema Sala, with uh, Marie um, and all the other things. I think there is a, a more of this very specifically Filipino and Filipino American um, Filipino uh, uh, film community that's that's forming, which is very exciting because it's a mix of uh, docs, uh, fiction, nonfiction, people who've been in the business for a long time, emerging, you know, uh, mentoring emerging voices because that's really key. That's really important. If we want, I always say, if we want, if we want to be heard, we have to scale up. You know, we can't yeah. just be the only ones in the room. It has to scale. And that's about, that's, that's all about mentoring, mentoring uh, young filmmakers. So it's exciting, I think, uh, to, to see it happening, you know, um, and collaboration with each other. I think that's really important. It's really key. I agree. I mean, for the longest time, it was just Ramona. Like, we'd always be like, you know, like. <laughs> it's just lonely. Ramona, it's it's just lonely. Yeah, you know, and yeah. even just this year alone, if you think about it, there's Eurofilm, there's Yellow Rose, there's Lingua Franca, you know, um, you know, Happy Jail. I mean, there's yeah. a lot, you know, yeah, and, every, and, and what's exciting about it is you're right. It's documentary feature, it's series, it's narrative feature, you know, it's short films, you know, it's, it's across the board now, which is really exciting. And I think there's interest. What's also exciting is, even, you know, us talking about it, like our films are screening in both countries, you know, to both audiences, like, so hopefully we're making work that kind of bridges, you know, between the two countries also, which is exciting. Yeah, it's an exciting time, I think, to be a filmmaker right now. Um, let's hope, let's see. <laughs> let's hope. Next question Not from just Gar a Next question from Garvo uh, Saboboro. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, how do you evaluate a potential character for your documentary who could be interesting and engaging, but otherwise unreliable, unpredictable, or perhaps untrustworthy? This is for the both of you. Untr an unreliable narrator? Uh, that was my very first film. <laughs> Imelda was very unreliable. Uh, I like unreliable narrators. You know, uh, there's something about them that's so it's challenging. Imelda. Yeah, I mean, it's challenging, right? But um, I, I think there's a way to also communicate the audience that they're unreliable. Um, but to me, that because it makes it very complicated and complex, if they're, and complexity is key to, uh, for me, for to, to making documentaries and choosing subjects. Um, uh, I, I think, and that evolves too, I think, based on your relationship with the, with the protagonist, with the participant in your film. I always finding, I don't know what, how to call them, they're not subject, they're protagonists, they're uh, the people who are in your film. I think uh, if you stay long enough with them, you will come to some kind of their truth, right? What it is they want to say. Um, and, um, but it takes a long time. It's really time that, that will make them uh, that, where you'll hit upon a certain um, uh, something that's genuine about them, whether or not, yeah, no, no matter how they say it, right? But it's it is genuine to their what they believe. Uh, it, it's to their to their truth, but not. It takes a while. It takes real trust. It takes real um, an understanding that you are not out to get them. That you're not out to your. I always say I'm not reality television. I am not out to get bad behavior, right? I'm not out to get you like doing something you're not supposed to. Um, so uh, once they understand that, I think they will, they, they'll come around, but they, it, it's a process. I think it's a long process. I agree. I mean, the thing with it is if you're going to film someone, it's also a relationship, right? So you have to build yeah. It's a, you have to build that trust both ways. They have to trust you, you have to trust them somehow. Um, and um, and yeah, I think it's interesting, the word choice, unreliable, unpredictable, <laughs> perhaps untrustworthy. Because <laughs> that's it too, right? When you first meet someone, you kind of have to figure these things out and negotiate it. Um, I, think, I think it can be challenging when you're, um, you know, maybe following someone who doesn't hold the same uh, point of view that you do 
Um, and that's always a challenge, but, um, you know, but hopefully there's a way there where you can engage with them and maybe film them without judging them at that moment, right? Letting them live their truth and you can capture it um, and present it how you like. But, um, you know, I think that's kind of important. I think that's some of the trust building there too, because I think, I think if you're going to film someone who you don't agree with necessarily, you know, um, I don't think you have to um, change your point of view for them, but maybe allow them to, you know, still be comfortable with you having your own point of view, but understanding that you still want to film them somehow. So I think it's a, I think it's a, you know, negotiation there, just earning, earning trust, right? You have to earn it. I also think that even if you don't agree with them, you have to really be curious about them. You have to really want to understand the difference, right? Like with Mrs. Marcos, I really, really wanted to understand her because I was, you know, again, like I said, I was raised under martial law. She was part of my DNA. I mean, she, I grew up with her image. And so I really wanted to unpack her. I really wanted to understand where she came from, how, uh, and the systems that allowed someone like Marcus to stay in power for so long. And how, how, what happens in your mind that you can rationalize all the things that happened during martial law and still be okay with it. I, I had a real curiosity. I'm, I'm also very open to changing my mind. You know, uh, if, if I change my mind, I, I'm open to that. Obviously, I did not with Imelda, you know, uh, but I really, really wanted to, uh, I think there has to be deep curiosity and deep uh, really wanting to know what makes them tick, right? Not going there, be, like, like PJ said, like being judgmental. You already know. It's like, then why make the film, right? To me, it's a revelation of character that makes the documentary so interesting. And if they change over time and you change over time, if they surprise you, they probably will surprise your audience, right? That's what you, and that's what you want. The surprise, the thing that was least expected. Um, okay, so the next question, I think uh, I, this might be the last question for tonight. Uh, yeah. What was the, from Rafi Landayan, what was the one documentary that influenced you to become a documentary filmmaker? Uh, that's tough. I mean, there's so many. I'm, from the great verite films like um, Salesman to Ross uh, McElwee's Sherman's March, which was a personal film, to Errol Morris's very stylistic uh, Thin Blue Line, to Chris Marker's Sans Soleil, which was essayistic and impressionistic, Everything, it's so hard it's so, because they're so different, right? Um, but I'm trying to think of that document that made me say, aha, I, I can do this. Uh, I think it was, um, it was probably Errol Morris's Sin Blue Line. I said, wow, that's an interesting way of telling a story. Uh, but there were others. Oh my God. Um, yeah, Sherman's March was certainly and a salesman and yeah, so many, because they're so different. Uh, but I, I, I was very attracted to the very pure observational films, just dropping someone in a situation and trying to figure out what's happening. Um, yeah, I know I didn't really answer it, but everything. <laughs> I mean, so many, and, and the form is changing constantly right now. I think it's also exciting. Um, you know, some things you would like, uh, so, so some things, you know, like, where it's going, but I think people are experimenting more. So, um, which is good, which is good for the field because it sort of pushes the boundaries of what the documenters can be about. I agree. I mean, as someone who grew up in the US, like, you know, the early days of documentary from my um, perspective were, uh, you know, mostly informative documentaries that were on PBS. And especially as a kid, you know, they were kind of like these kids programming, like, you know, you know, you see a tree get chopped down and this is how you get a pencil, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, or it was like Nova, you know, or, um, you know, um, you know, National Geographic, you know, so I don't think I ever really had an understanding of what documentary was until much later, you know, as, as an adult. Um, 
And then even then, I think a lot of the times I thought of documentary having a very specific uh, subject. So for me, um, some of the films that have been interesting have been subjects where I'm like, oh, I didn't realize you can make a documentary about that, you know? For me in particular, like Paris is Burning was one of those documentaries where I was like, oh, you can make a film about like the subculture. Um, you know, Grey Gardens, <laughs> like who oh, knew? Well, Gardens. These could be subjects of a documentary, you know? Um, you know, so I think there's, you know, lots of documentaries that I think are really inspiring. Um, you know, and for me now, now that I have seen more documentaries, it's, I'm also very excited to see what filmmakers are doing within their documentaries, right? Like, uh, like for Ramona, it was particularly exciting to see Ramona do Motherland. Like I had no yeah. idea she was working on this film, you know, <laughs> and, and having, having seen all of Ramona's films up until then, it was so great to see like, oh my God, you know, this is a different, you know, now she's doing this totally observational, you know, um, lyrical, you know, film which is really great to see, you know, the kind of breadth and scope of like a filmmaker. And so I'm kind of interested, you know, that inspires me now is seeing filmmakers make more than one film and the different types of film that they make and, uh, you know, and the different approaches. And, and I agree with Ramona too. It's getting, it's, I mean, everyone, everyone's saying like right now is like the documentary, the golden age of documentary. I don't know if that's true, but what I will say- For some people. Is, <laughs> for some people, yeah, for some people. But what I will say is there's definitely some exciting um, cinema coming out of out of documentary. Um, ones that maybe I didn't, you know, um, you know, see coming or just someone drops a new film and you're like, wow, that's really amazing. You know, um, yeah, like I'm just trying to think even this last year, there were so many documentaries where like for Sama, when I saw for Sama, I was like, wow, this yeah. is a really great film from a perspective I didn't think I would be able to see told in a way that I didn't think I was going to be able to see, you know? So there's a lot of um, exciting work out there. What I will say is for everyone out there, I'm sure you guys are all documentary um, enthusiasts or otherwise, I don't know why you'd be listening to us talking about it, but I think it's important <laughs> to, you know, encourage people to watch too, because yeah. that's, that's what allows people like Ramona and myself to keep making more, you know, is we need people to watch them also. So, um, you know, so watch them how you can. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on Netflix, you know, Netflix. I mean, good or bad, I mean, Netflix, you know, it gives you access to other, to films that you would otherwise not see, right? So, but sometimes they get lost because the platform is so humongous, you don't know. But there are some things that are out there, like um, what's out there that's really interesting. I mean, the, Oh, I don't know if it's in it. Uh, Dick Johnson is Dead, I think it's really interesting. It just mm -hmm. premiered. Um, uh, I, I don't know. But there, there's really, if you, you have to watch films in order to make films, I think. Right? Just watch a lot of films. Just if you're, uh, if you're not doing anything, watch. Watch anything. Watch it even if you hate it. Right? Um, I think because that's how you learn. You learn best with both good and bad work. And then you also figure out what, what it is you like, what it is you don't like, um, how you can say certain things that you've always wanted to say. Just expose yourself, be open to new work. And, old, and of course, the, cat, the, the old works, you know. I think it's also exciting too, to see these narrative filmmakers who are taking nonfiction approaches to some yeah. of the work that they're making also, because they're learning. I think they're watching documentaries and being like, wow, you can't make up this stuff. Like this is this is how real life unfolds, oh, and this is how a filmmaker presents it and directs that scene, and so it's kind of exciting to see some filmmakers doing that also. So I think we're gonna close, and we <laughs> right. some time. Woohoo! We're on yes, time. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We will. We still have. We have I, I have bought more time. Uh, so I, this is kid from high school that wants to ask a question. I can't not leave this one alone. So okay. how, All right. uh, <laughs> she chose not to identify herself. That's fine. Uh, she says, she asks, hello, I would like to ask, the, the, I'm a senior in college about to graduate in the pandemic age. As an aspiring documentary filmmaker, what advice do you have for navigating the industry life in these times? 
Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, there are so many things that are being made available for free in pandemic, right? There's one amazing conference going on right now, Getting Real, which is um, um, uh, organized by the International Documentary Association. Um, I, just be aware of what's being offered online for free and go there, right? And, and during, pandem during the pandemic, that's all in terms of knowing what's being talked about, new work that's coming down, people that are participating in those, in those spaces. I think that's one thing because they're free. They're online. It's accessible. So I think you should t take advantage. A lot of streaming as well is happening. And um, I, I think that they also have like special, you know, special breaks for, for students at these film festivals that you would otherwise not have access to because you have to go there but now they're virtual. So take advantage of that, right? Uh, just watch work, be in those spaces where they're having panels like this one. Uh, so it's great that you're here. Um, and, and then just know who the players are and depending on where you are also, right? Um, I find that I'm more open to talking to a lot more people because I'm home, right? So, um, uh, see who you want to talk to, see how, if you can um, get access to uh, uh, how you can contact them, contact the big organizations, right? So like whatever, uh, IDA, Sundance, get to know who are funding, just get to know the landscape right now because there's nothing, it's so hard. Very few people are, are shooting. Sh there's shooting to be done. There, people are shooting, but very few are. A lot of people are in development. And also depending, where, where is he or she? Is it a woman? I, I don't know, Whatever, wherever they are, uh, there's more, sh sh I think a lot more shooting in New York happening in LA than other places as always. But, um, but right now it's really, there's so much that's uh, accessible online and uh, just be aware of them and, and listen and go to those spaces and comment and, you know, yeah, that's, that would be my advice. I agree. And if you're interested in making something, try to make something. You know, I think you can probably, you can do it safely. Um, you know, I've been watching a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, you don't have to jump necessarily into a feature. You can make a really great short documentary, you know, and watch some of the short docs are like New York Op Docs or The Guardian Docs or Topic or, you know, um, the Atlantic, those, making amazing. Yeah, the Atlantic. Yeah, people are making some really great work in the short um, format. If you identify as Asian, there's a group called ADOC, which is a-doc.org, um, which is a network of Asian American documentary filmmakers and Asian filmmakers. Um, they did a whole series called COVID Stories, where it was, you know, um, people making these, um, I think they're like five minutes or less short documentaries that were filmed um, during COVID lockdown. So people are making stuff. Um, but I agree with Ramona, there's so much stuff right now, um, because everyone is stuck, uh, you know, trying to quarantine that there's a lot of things that are happening for free. So take advantage of all of that watch and learn and listen. There's so much uh, inspiring stuff. And, and with that, um, it's the end of our panel. Uh, I'd like to thank All right. Ramona and PJ for being our guest speakers tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank... What everyone. happened? Oh. Faye? Okay. Uh, Faye, unmute yourself. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanna, I'd like to thank everyone who's, who's been watching uh, this Saturday night to watch our panel. I'd like to thank Ramona and PJ being here f uh, with us. If you want to know more about uh, Ramona and PJ, they have, uh, how, how do they contact you? How do they follow you? Where do they want to follow you? On, on Twitter, on I'm at Cine Diaz, um, and on Facebook, I think I'm R.S. Diaz. And I, I was just typing um, the, the website of a thousand cuts dot film. They can also contact me there because, and they can also figure out where the film's showing. Cause we're still in virtual cinema, I think. We're still in cinemas around the country. So I'm just gonna type that on the chat. Awesome. 
Yeah, my social handle is just PJ Raval on every platform, <laughs> except ah, except cool. TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but I am on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, and that's also my website. You can just go to pjraval.com. Awesome. And uh, with uh, if you you can also follow uh, the chamber Filipino American Hollywood. So mixed up. Philippine American Chamber of Commerce of Hollywood. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and YouTube. We have a YouTube page. Follow that. We have, we'll have this panel on YouTube as well. Uh, okay. And you can also follow the LA Philippine International Film Festival on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, there we go. How to memorize all this stuff. Uh, everyone, have a great Saturday. Everyone have a great weekend. Everyone have a great first Monday. And happy <laughs> Filipino American uh, History Month. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, us. thank you. This has been amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let's do it. Bye.